Welcome to Safety Spectrum, your environmental health and safety connection. This program is a presentation of the Michigan Safety Conference. For almost a century, the annual conference has provided credible educational opportunities and valuable support to the safety and health practitioner by offering 120 instructional programs along with exhibits highlighting the latest in safety equipment, instrumentation, and demonstrations. To learn more about the conference, please find us at mich.safetyconference.org. Welcome to Safety Spectrum. I'm your host, Sheila Eide. This program is sponsored by the Michigan Safety Conference, and our topic today is safety and compliance issues in retail cannabis. In a follow-up to our last podcast, I'm interviewing two representatives from SkyMint Brands, which produces and sells cannabis in the retail market. Which, In this relatively new industry, what are some of the issues of essential concern to the EHS professional? Jennifer Brown joined SkyMint in 2018 as Director of Security. In a role at SkyMint, Jennifer leverages her expertise in safety and security to create the best environment for the employees, facilities, and products, addressing issues for two growing and processing plants and 20-plus retail stores in Michigan. Prior to SkyMint, Jennifer spent over 20 years implementing safety and security solutions in a variety of industries. She was also a lieutenant with the Michigan State University Police for over 16 years, working with Homeland Security, the FBI, Michigan State Police, as well as other law enforcement agencies. She holds a BA and master's in criminal justice and is a certified professional emergency manager in the state of Michigan. Our second speaker, Kylie Hayden, SkyMint's EHS coordinator, has worked in environmental health and safety for over 15 years, primarily in the healthcare setting and regulatory compliance at Bronson Healthcare Group, overseeing compliance for three hospitals and 100 plus offsite locations including environmental compliance, equipment safety, and safe patient handling, where she implemented a program reducing injuries related to patient care by 33%. Kylie became the EHS coordinator for SkyMen Brands in 2022, responsible for ensuring organizational compliance with regulations while maintaining the safest possible working environment for employees and the surrounding community. She oversees all aspects of compliance with OSHA, MyOSHA, CRA, and MDARD standards, as well as programs such as respiratory protection, hazard communication, pit safety, PPE, employee reporting, and emergency preparedness and response. Kylie holds a BS Environmental and Resource Analysis from Western Michigan University. Thank you for joining me today, Jennifer and Kylie. Good morning, Sheila. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Um, we're going to start off with Jennifer. And can you tell me a little bit about your do- job duties, responsibilities at uh, SkyMint? Absolutely. So when I first started, I was simply in charge of security, and that has expanded over the years to oversee uh, both safety and security across all of our locations. SkyMint is a statewide uh, company, so we have presence here in Michigan. At our peak, we had uh, four production facilities in the state of Michigan that did include an outdoor farm, One of our production facilities currently has an extraction uh, capability. And then we have over 20 retail locations in the state of Michigan. We also have one uh, corporate location and that is based in Ann Arbor. So it's uh, very complex having locations throughout the state of Michigan. So what makes safety unique in the cannabis industry? So there's a couple of things that make it unique. So first and foremost, it's a relatively new industry. So you think about regulated industries across the United States, things like utilities, the energy space, banking, pharmaceutical, railroads, petroleum, those have been around for decades. And with cannabis here in Michigan, it was uh, in 2018 that the state of Michigan Uh, gave their first license uh, for retail sales. And so we are definitely a new industry here in the state of Michigan. So that makes it unique. It makes it unique also because regulators here in the state of Michigan are still learning. And as they learn what things to do better and safer, the regulations change. So the regulations here in Michigan have been a moving target. And as a licensee, that makes it difficult to make sure that we are um, maintaining a safe facility that is in compliance with all those regulations. And I think you told me it's only been five years that the license has been uh, 
And after our meeting with Eric at last month, uh, there are a lot of regulations, including agriculture. Correct. Since you're growing. So what regulatory bodies oversee the cannabis industry? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, here in the state of Michigan, we have quite a few different um, regulatory bodies. Primarily, we start with the Cannabis Regulatory Agency, often referred to as the CRA. And they oversee the licensees, mainly from a compliance and a security perspective. And then on the safety side, we have MDARD, which is the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. We also have EGLE, which is the Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. We also have BFS, which is Bureau of Fire Services. That's here in the state of Michigan. And then we also have MIOSHA. And then, of course, we all uh, also have local inspectors, both on the building side of things, as well as fire. So we have many different regulatory bodies that come in and do inspections. Um, I, again, come from a background of safety and security and was used to inspections. But when I came into this particular uh, space, I was shocked at the number of inspections that we have. So on a weekly basis, we have at least a couple of inspections across all of our facilities here in the state of Michigan. Some of those are scheduled inspections, but we also um, are used to having unannounced inspections as well. For example, this last week, we had two unannounced inspections in one day. Oh, at the same facility? Different facilities. I mean, not to make light of it, but I think there's a certain amount of curiosity involved in this new industry and... People Absolutely. See what it, check it out. So do, do the uh, the growing uh, facilities get more inspections than the retail establishments, or have you ever looked at it that way? They are um, pretty equal in the number of inspections. Uh, MDARD and Eagle tend to focus more on the production and processing facilities, whereas the retail locations are primarily inspected by the CRA. BFS and local inspectors for your licensing part of it. Correct. So, yeah, of course you're using you're using pesticides and different chemicals, obviously in the growing facilities and the greenhouses. So that carries its own set of regulations. Absolutely. So, how is training accomplished with such a with a large cannabis company, which you obviously are? Yes. So when we first started, uh, I think I was probably the fifth or sixth uh, employee hired by SkyMed, it was very easy to train um, our employees because we were in one location. We could do on-site face-to-face training, which for me is always a preference. I prefer to do the in-person training because you can read facial expressions, you can help um, clarify when people ask questions. And so that is my first choice of doing training. However, as we expanded at our peak, SkyMint had almost a thousand employees, which made it very difficult to do in-person training. So the company launched a learning management system where we do a vast majority of our training today. Um, Kylie actually is the one that's responsible for the LMS system. And we're able to upload all of our training requirements uh, so that employees can take that training online. Some of the trainings do have tests that are required. They can complete that on uh, line as well. And the nice thing about the LMS system is if it is, for example, an OSHA required training, the company that we contract with ensures that the training they provide to us is up to date with OSHA standards. The other nice thing about the LMS system is it does allow us to create our own site-specific training, and we can upload that into the system as well. We also have many, many policies and procedures, um, again, to ensure our employees are acting both safely and in a secure manner. And so we do uh, a lot of times upload our policies and procedures and require our employees to read and acknowledge those on an annual basis to make sure that they are aware of those policies and procedures and any changes that may have occurred within that past year. Well, a couple of questions related to the training. Uh, do you have like a separate uh, program for management than you do for the rank and file? Yes, that's a great question. And we do have uh, separate trainings that are specific to our supervisor and managers. Often those trainings um, come from an HR uh, perspective. So 
um, how to discipline or how to uh, do something specific as a supervisor or manager in the organization. And those trainings are specifically designed for those individuals. And online training also brings its own set of challenges about whether they actually sat through the material or did they test out or how do you, how do you ascertain that they actually got what you want them to get out of it? That, that's a great question and exactly why I started with I prefer uh, in-person training because you really do, um, you know, see people's facial expressions and, you know, understand the questions that they're asking. And so you really do have a better feel if they're understanding that content. So that is one of the drawbacks of using an LMS system. One way to understand if somebody is not only acknowledge the training, but understood it, is to ask questions in person. So we ask that our managers and our supervisors within all of our locations quiz our employees and ask questions to make sure that they have understood the training and understand our policies and procedures, again, to ensure that we have safe environment. Do you feel like you have a good team uh, morale? And does everybody kind of work as a team? Everybody look out for each other? Is that something you emphasize as well? I, I'm smiling because, again, I've been in you know many industries over the last 25 years, and I have never worked for a company where people are so excited about working every day. Um, it has been a breath of fresh air to come to work for the last five years where people actually enjoy their jobs. They are very um, passionate about cannabis, and it is a wonderful company to work for and a wonderful industry just for that reason alone. Interesting, interesting. Are there any standards set as it relates to safety? So cannabis is still federally illegal, which is one of uh, our challenges. Um, because it is federally illegal, there are no national safety standards as it relates to workplace safety and best practices. So a lot of the inspectors rely on NFPA1. So NFPA1 is the National Fire Protection Agency standards. Those are used uh, across the United States here. And again, the vast majority of the local inspectors rely on that. In September of 2021, I was selected to participate in an NFPA working group to develop uh, safety standards for the cannabis industry so that not just here in Michigan, but across the United States and Canada, we could have specific standards that licensed cannabis companies could rely on. And again, having one set of standards that we could all look to instead of piecemealing it together was very exciting. And so I joined that working group in 2021 and I would guess I was a little naive at the time. I expected that uh, working group to take a year or so to develop the standards and roll them out. I have quickly learned that um, NFPA develops their standards over a five or six year period. And so it will still be some time before we see those national standards come out. And of course, you also have public input on those kind of standards, don't you? Yes. So there has to be a comment period and all that. Yeah, working for Myosha, I know exactly what you're going through. <laughs> yes, this was my first experience working closely with NFPA. So it was definitely a learning curve and definitely surprising that it was uh, such a time-consuming process. And don't even ask me how long it took to find space as standard. It be <laughs> part of the, part I can of imagine standards. it was uh, oh, time-consuming. Over 20 well. years, I'm sure it was, absolutely. So, okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to go to the EHS coordinator, Kylie. Um, what this is a really interesting question when you answered this for me when we talked about this before. But what are the greatest challenges in managing safety and security in this industry? So, for me, the greatest challenges from a safety perspective are related to the newness of the industry. Um, in more established industries, you have um, metrics, benchmarks, and time tested best practices um, that help guide decision making. Right now in cannabis, we're kind of putting those things into place as we go. Um, and related to this, uh, historically legal restrictions have limited scientific research into the cannabis industry. So we're establishing practices and programs with limited data available. Um, and then of course, regulatory variability is a challenge as well, especially in regards to the newness of the industry. As um, Jen mentioned, as uh, information becomes available, it drives regulatory change and improvement. Um, which benefits us, but it's definitely a challenge to stay on top of. 
Um, an example of this was a recent change in pesticide use. Um, previously, acceptable pesticides had been determined by their active ingredients, and that changed to the brand name of the pesticide. Um, ultimately, that change made the overall product selection process easier, and it makes the overall process safer. Um, however, it did take resources for us to identify unacceptable pro um, products and then make changes to our inventory and internal IPM processes. Um, and finally, one challenge that's not related to the newness of the industry would be the scope. SkyMint is a vertically integrated operation. Um, so that includes everything from farming to production to retail. Um, and all of those operations come with their own regulatory requirements as well. Well, as you're so new at this and five years being licensed, so have you become a leader in the industry, but, you know, by default, I mean, trying to work because <laughs> normally, like you say, a lot of these things have been tried and true to, with other companies or years of scientific research and you're having to create the, create the wheel basically. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think there's definitely some openings for um, leadership within uh, safety in the cannabis industry, but um that's part of the change that I'd like to help drive is an increase in collaboration and information sharing so that, um, you know, we have different resources to rely on. Um, so it's not just all of us kind of fending for ourselves. Uh, why is continuous improvement especially important in the cannabis industry? So continuous improvement and safety are closely intertwined concepts in all industries. Um, but in an industry that is new and developing like cannabis is, it becomes especially important to continuously evaluate your programs and your processes. Um, and not just upon initial implementation, it's really important to check back and make additional improvements as needed on a pretty regular basis. Um, one of the reasons for this is right now, the cannabis industry is experiencing an explosion of innovation and technology from other industries is being adapted for use within the cannabis industry. So this means that there's a lot of trial and error going on um, without necessarily being able to predict how it's gonna impact safety within our environments. Um, so because of this, in order to assist with decision-making, it's important to identify and then monitor measurable metrics that help contact that help guide the continuous um, improvement process. Um, so some of the metrics that we monitor internally at SkyMint include um, incidents such as injuries, events involving equipment damage, and near misses. Um, and I also did want to mention that getting employee feedback on a new process is an, an essential part of continuous improvement. Having some way of communicating with your team and then allowing them to provide feedback will help ensure that you've evaluated all aspects of the new process or the equipment. So we do, we do that in a couple ways. Um, first of all, the end users are always involved in the job safety analysis process. And second, we have a safety committee that meets monthly that allows our employees to give feedback on new processes or equipment or any other sort of um, safety ideas or feedback that they might have. Well, how do you broadcast successes in failures, should I say, with the industry? Or do you? Or do you have a vehicle to do that? Um, you mean between companies? Like, between companies, like if you discover, hey, this worked, or gosh, this didn't work. Is there any vehicle for that yet? I, I can help answer that. So um, Kylie's position with SkyMint is very unique. Many of the cannabis companies here in the state of Michigan don't have a person dedicated specifically to safety and security. And so that's why when she talks about the importance of collaboration, it is very difficult to collaborate here in the state of Michigan in the cannabis industry with other safety professionals because they just don't really exist. Um, about three years ago, I worked very closely with another individual and we developed the Association for Cannabis Safety and Security. It brings together um, security professionals and compliance professionals here in the state of Michigan in the cannabis industry where we do share best practices and again, a lot of them turn into safety best practices as the discussion because these other companies don't have somebody dedicated to that specific role. And so it's often the security person that is um, in charge of safety or the compliance person. And so um, it is very difficult to have um, metrics in place because again, there's just not the bandwidth to do that here in the state of Michigan. I know you get inspected a lot, but do you collaborate with MyOSHA at all as far as you with these regulations? Because you are regulated a lot of their standards. 
So is that something that you've looked into or consultation? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we uh, participated in their voluntary inspection program, which we found really helpful. Um, and I would encourage anybody in the cannabis industry who hasn't been through that process um, to become involved with it, reach out and schedule something like that because um, not only is it important feedback and can help so identify some of the weaker spots within your safety program, um, but it's also really good for creating points of contacts when you have questions arise. Plus you're educating them, which is also good. Yes, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So how is risk assessed in the production environment and where are the areas of greatest risk? Um, so we need to evaluate risk anytime we introduce a new process or if a process changes. Um, this could include the addition of new materials or equipment, or it could be if we introduce a new task. Um, I find using risk assessment tools and job safety analysis tools uh, very helpful for pinpointing areas of risk and then determining if we've managed those risks to an acceptable level or if further intervention is needed. Um, risk itself is determined by weighing the likelihood of occurrence with the severity of the outcome. Um, this means having historical incident data for your environment is really important for you to be able to make that determination. Um, I'll give you a couple examples of some areas of risk that we've evaluated at SkyMet. So at SkyMet, we've evaluated several of our extraction processes as higher risk. Um, although we've never had a major incident occur, we do know that if one were to occur, um, the outcome has the potential to be severe. So it's given a higher risk rating. Um, on the other hand, we also have slips, trips, and falls on our radar. Um, we know from our own data that um, the outcome of a slip, trip, and fall isn't severe. However, we also know from our own data that it is one of the most common types of injuries that we see throughout our facilities, um, making the likelihood of occurrence higher. Having multiple years of incident data is what guides us in making these determination. And overall, that's what helps decide the best places to invest our resources. You mentioned uh in your first example that uh, there could be an incident that could have an impact outside of the plant, outside of like in the community, mm -hmm. like a chemical um, release or something? Yep, there, there's potential in the extraction processes um, for that. However, we've mitigated that risk to the point where that is very unlikely it would happen. Um, for example, um, we've got um, our extraction processes taking place in C1, D1 booths which help minimize any sort of impact to the community um, or areas of the building. Um, we also have very, very thorough training um, practices in place. We also have um, emergency preparedness response training in place. Um, our extraction techs are highly trained. And then of course we have things like PPE that help mit um, mitigate risk to the individual person working in that process. Yeah, drawing on my experiences as a safety director at wastewater plant, they used chlorine for a long time until they realized ultraviolet light could do the same thing. So mm -hmm. we had to practice a chlorine leak for mm -hmm. the community. I mean, and actually figure out how we're going to shut the tank down, that type of thing. So yeah, yeah. scary we've stuff. Never, we've never had a um, major spill incident, but we do do um, tabletop drills to practice what we would do in the event of an actual um, spill or leak or something like that. Excellent. So what resources are available for cannabis businesses businesses to stay updated on the safety regs? So like we were discussing earlier, um, one of the best resources out there are the partnerships that you can create with regulatory um, agencies. For example, what we were talking about with the Myosha um, Voluntary Inspection Program, um, participating in things like this help make connections. And another way to help make connections is participating in training seminars that are put on throughout the year. In the past year, I've attended trainings for Sarah Title II, or Sarah Title III reporting, air permit reporting, and waste management. Um, even if you've taken uh, similar trainings in the past, um, attending these sessions help you stay on top of both uh, regulatory changes and regulatory calendars. And then finally, uh, many of the agencies that we partner with, including CRA and MDARD, offer educational sessions through webinars. A lot of these webinars tend to specifically focus on recent changes, um, so they're extremely valuable for keeping up to date. 
So if you're looking for ways to get involved with these types of resources, uh, most of the resources can be found on agency websites, including recordings of previous trainings. Um, you can also subscribe to email updates and newsletters, which will help you stay informed of upcoming trainings and opportunities. Constantly researching, constantly <laughs> staying on top. Oh, yeah. Um, why do you believe this topic is important? Now, at one point we were when we were talking, you one of you said that you, you look at the industry as like a farm to table industry. So you're controlling it from beginning to end. Yeah, here at SkyMint, we are vertically integrated, as Kylie had mentioned earlier. And what that really means is it is farm to table. So we uh, grow our own cannabis. We um, also turn that um, cannabis into edibles. We produce flour, and then it goes right into our retail locations. So it is um, an interesting uh, industry because we are vertically integrated. And it, it's important in our industry, again, because it's so new, you know, we're not just not sure of regulations, we're not sure of changes. And so we always want to go above and beyond. And that has been our goal here at SkyMint. If a standard is set, we're going to go above that standard just again to ensure the safety of our employees and uh, facilities. Are you the largest, uh, is SkyMint the largest uh, manufacturer in uh, retail? operation? We know? are not the largest in the Mich uh, Michigan um, area, nor the United States. Um, there are several companies that are larger than ours at this point. But you do sound like you're a leader. The, the job has been thrust upon you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We have tried, again, to really set our um, expectations high and exceed any standards in the industry. And again, hopefully um, other companies have um, followed in our footsteps. When I first started, um, cannabis was often viewed as, you know, top secret information. Um, again, coming from law enforcement, um, I came up in an industry where information sharing was very easy. Um, I could call somebody from another state, um, give them information about who I was, and they would instantly share information. So I just sort of expected that in the cannabis industry. When I started five years ago, California, Colorado, there were some pretty well-established states that had had cannabis legal for over 10 years. So I thought, oh gosh, this will be easy. I'll just fly out to Colorado, you know, look at their facilities, look at all their standards, and then implement those here in Michigan. Well, I had a little uh, quick lesson and learned uh, very quickly that um, people in this industry, when it first started, were very protective about the information sharing. I think they thought, you know, some top secret cannabis strain information would be released. And what I have found is over the last four or five years, um, cannabis uh, folks here in Michigan are much better about sharing information and they realize the benefits of learning best practices from each other. And again, the bottom line is the safety of employees. It doesn't matter how we get there. Yeah, and I think uh, Kyle, Kylie, you wanted to say something about collaboration too. Yeah, so that is one of the reasons that having this, um, discussing this topic is so important to me um, because even though there have been improvements over the past five years, I do believe that there's still a lot of room for information in cannabis safety right now. Um, I love to be able to create connections and allow for information sharing between people working in cannabis safety in Michigan. Um, so if anybody is interested in collaboration, if anybody has any suggestions or feedback, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And the best way to get a hold of me would be via email. My email address is khayden at skymintbrands.com. That's K-H-A-Y-D-E-N at skymintbrands.com. Great. Uh, so any final thoughts that you wanted to uh, to tell me? I think there were a couple interesting issues that you, you brought up to me. I just want to reiterate that, again, we um, continue to learn on a daily basis as it um, relates to safety and security in the cannabis industry. And we are always trying to exceed standards in the industry and create best practices for the safety and security of our employees. Didn't you also mention that you were the first licensed in Michigan? We were the first uh, license in Michigan, and um, now if you look at uh, the number of licensees here in the state of Michigan, it has grown significantly. 
Um, most uh, municipalities across the state of Michigan have um, opened their, their minds and their jurisdictions to cannabis um, for many different reasons. And so now you'll see a, a very large presence across the state of licensed facilities. So more, more people to regulate you, right? <laughs> In each individual <laughs> city or town or municipality. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, as we've just learned, this industry has its share of challenges in providing a safe and healthy workplace for its employees, as well as a closely monitored adherence to several government regulatory bodies. Thank you to Kylie Hayden and Jennifer Brown from SkyMint Brands. In coming attractions, Jennifer will be speaking at the 2024 Michigan Safety Conference in Grand Rapids in April on safety and security in the cannabis industry. Good program, not to miss it. If you have any questions about the podcast, Michigan Safety Conference, or you'd like to be a guest, or sponsor one of our podcasts. Information can be found on our website at michsafetyconference.org. Thank you for listening to Safety Spectrum. This is Sheila Ide.